is a magical place. There, there's just no more concise way to say it. There's a reason that myself and millions of other just love it. And one of my favorite corners of the park is New Orleans Square. And I mean, how could it not be? It's got great theming. It's got Pirates of the Caribbean. It's got the Haunted Mansion. And it's always my first stop in the parks. I mean, maybe to get a fast pass or something. But after I pick it up, hightail it to the mansion. Pirates, yeah, pirates can wait. It's, it's usually second. But gotta get to Mansion first. It's a little awkward, however, a few years back. I kind of was there and I'm like, huh. The Haunted Mansion would be a slaveholding estate. Now, I know there's those that are rolling their eyes saying, the Mansion didn't have slaves. What kind of SJW cuckoldry is this? And it's true that Walt Disney Imagineering, or as they were known at the time, Wed Enterprises, didn't plan for the Haunted Mansion to be a slaveholding estate. But logic dictates that if it was a real estate in New Orleans, that they would be a slaveholding estate. And that just New Orleans Square in general just whitewashes history. Okay, so let's take a step back for a moment. We'll, we'll get back to the mansion being a slaveholding estate, but in the meantime, let's talk about the Atlantic slave trade and the impact that it had on New Orleans. Between the 16th and 19th centuries, around 10 million or so people were brought over from West Africa to be sold as slaves in Europe and America. On the trips to Americas, in, these individuals were forced into ships, crammed into claustrophobic conditions, and they had to endure one to three months of travel. There were many places in the Americas that these individuals were brought to, but one of the more popular areas, in mainland America at least, was in New Orleans. And it it was where the Gulf of Mexico met the Mississippi River, making for a logical place to sell slaves. Or, you know, as logical as chattel slavery could be. In 1908, the United States banned the international slave trade, although that's not to say that unauthorized sales didn't happen, but New Orleans was only so affected by this. In fact, New Orleans saw an influx of American-born slaves, and having rich soil from the Mississippi, New Orleans had its fair share of plantation estates. Plantations, of course, being oft worked by those enslaved. Okay, so how does this impact the Gracies being slaveholders? And I know... I know that Gracie's is not a canon name, but lack of a better name, that's what we're using. Anyways, how did we know that they were involved in the slave trade? Well, as stated, New Orleans had a thriving slave market, and I mean, just look at this house. This house is concrete proof in and of itself. This is a plantation estate in the antebellum style, antebellum literally meaning before war. I mean, these places were just exclusively ran on slave labor. I mean, we don't see a huge sprawl of land when, you know, before we enter the mansion or anything, but as we see entering the graveyard scene, we actually don't see all of the mansion property. As for the ghosts, we can't really tell their ethnicity, you know, for certain. I mean, they all seem to be European or American, and the only person I can say for certain being from Africa is that guy there. And, well, I think that's just kind of you know, imperialism. I think probably somebody pillaged a tomb and brought it back as a souvenir. But, you know, this mummy, they'd be from Northeast Africa, which East Africa had its own slave trade. Um, That was more so the Middle East, but it doesn't compare so much as the Atlantic slave trade. Now, you know what Disney almost did right with this? Well, there's actually two things. The Imagineers had known for some time that they wanted to do some kind of Haunted Mansion ride, and they had the building just sitting there for a while, but they were unsure on what to actually put in the house, like what kind of story they wanted. One of the ideas for the estate was for it to be owned by a Captain Gore. Captain Gore was a fearsome pirate who decided to give up his life of piracy, and with his ill-gotten gains, decided to, you know, build a nice house, settle down, all of that stuff. He meets a woman named Priscilla, and they fall in love and are to be married. Before they are to marry, however, she discovers his secret and he, out of rage, kills her until she just drives him so mad, her ghost, drives him so mad that he takes his own life. 
now why would I be bringing up this matter that made me put on a suicide content warning at the beginning? Well, this could have worked. Captain Gore, being a fish out of water, could have, you know, just been settled to the area and said, huh, these houses, they're luxurious. This is what the fancy people will have. You know, um, why can I not think of the word? I'm kind of, I, I have a script by ad lib to a certain extent. Contractor. Contractor, give me a house like the neighbors have. And, you know, not realizing that there's kind of connotations that come with us, with estates like that. And, um, yeah, he could have, I mean, he could have just been like, build me that. Of course, that's assuming he wasn't from mainland America. And, you know, that's kind of stretching things a little bit. Okay, so what is the second thing? <sighs> the Haunted Mansion movie. I, I know, I know, but hear me out. I'm not saying it's a great movie. Actually, I'm not even saying it's a bad movie because it's a guilty pleasure of mine to some extent. But, okay. I said almost, though. I can't find sources on this, but one of the plot details is that Elizabeth Henshaw, Master Gracie's love interest, is actually the daughter of a servant of Gracie Manor. Um, I looked on the commentary, the DVD commentary. I looked in the Jason Sorrell books. I couldn't find anything on the matter. The Haunted Mansion movie was about an interracial relationship be between the heir of the estate and the child of a slave. And I just, my, I just karate chopped my microphone. Why was this not played up? Ramsley's p plot would have actually seemed to have just made sense. I mean, he currently just hates Elizabeth because, eh? The idea that the mansion is haunted because of an act of pure hatred on Ramsley's part just would have likely have made this, you know, an Oscar winner or something. Okay, okay. so there's no white saviors in this movie. I mean, sure, the Evers family does get help from several white people, but, I mean, really it's the Evers and Elizabeth's spirit that saves the day. So, you know, white savior, there's none of that, so it wouldn't have got Oscars. But as is, the race aspects are just so underplayed that for the first, well, let's see... That movie came out 2003, so the first 15 or so years of that movie, I actually thought that Elizabeth was supposed to be white. I mean, as a whole, we don't really get to see Elizabeth all that much at the beginning. You know, she's heavily costumed, she's got a mask, at most we see a little bit of an arm or whatever, and we have this fresco, but oils, age, you know, when they age over time, they become yellow, stuff like that. So the whole time, this whole time, I've been thinking she was white, and just, I didn't realize she wasn't until it was spelled out for me. And that is how horribly the movie drops that ball. I mean, it's kind of stupid looking back because I knew that Elizabeth was played by the same woman that played Sarah, a, a black British actress. But it just, yeah, I, I thought Elizabeth was supposed to be white. Well, at least there's no other e-tickets that whitewash things, right? Yeah, so the Pirates of the Caribbean, a ride based on the golden age of piracy, in the Caribbean, you know, during the same time as the heyday of sugar as a cash crop? This ride doesn't have a single person of color. Walt Disney World kind of made an addition to change that, but Walt Di but Disneyland, we just, nope, they're all white. <laughs> but don't worry. Every single version of the ride has Johnny Depp. So, the Atlantic slave trade and the golden age of piracy did at times intersect. And when they did, it was... complicated. Though there were quite a number of African-born pirates, pirates were not liberators of slaves. That being said, they did offer the opportunity to join their crew, but their intents were practicality, not, not altruism. One of the reasons that pirates would cross the path of slavers would often be because they desired their ships. Pirates, if they had a larger crew, would desire larger ships, and slave ships carried a large number of people as is, so they would go ransack those, and they would offer, you know, they would say to everybody on board, slaves and crew alike, hey, or, you know, all of you that aren't dead, you have two options here. You can join us. Or we could just maroon you and leave you to be discovered, you know, just doing your thing. You know, just gonna drop you off on an island and hopefully somebody picks you up. And that counted for the slaves as well. And once they were discovered, and let's be realistic here, they were reintroduced into the slave trade. 
And pirates actually did work in the black market of people smuggling. Once it did become Ill illegal to sell slaves from other countries, some pirates did actually still do that. The lack of diversity in Pirates of the Caribbean is just mind-boggling. The Caribbean was a melting pot of cultures, and here we are, just flooded in a sea of white. Just like the mansion and New Orleans Square just in general, Pirates of the Caribbean whitewashes history. And although not in New Orleans Square, I do feel like there is another attraction that should be addressed. Right next door to the Haunted Mansion is Splash Mountain. Now, of course, Splash Mountain is based on the animated segments of Song of the South, a film that is problematic. But the sharecropper stuff is not in the right whatsoever. It just shows some of Br'er Rabbit's scenes, which are, of course, inspired by the Uncle Ramus tales as published by Joel Chandler Harris. And it should be noted that Joel Chandler Harris did not create the Uncle Ramus stories. He heard these stories from those working on, you know, plantations, and he collected the tales and sold them. Harris, in essence, profited off of black culture, and there's also some pretty racist stereotypes in the books. There is a bit of a catch about Harris, however. Without him, it's actually possible that we wouldn't have known the Uncle Remus stories. We might not know about Br'er Rabbit, or at least not so well as we do. So it's a little more complicated than just saying Joel Chandler Harris bad, but it's still, still cultural appropriation. So why did I mention Song of the South, Joel Chandler Harris, Uncle Remus? Well, ultimately, Joel Chandler Harris exploited those enslaved for profit. And if that's not the exact thing that New Orleans and America did, I don't know what is. New Orleans Square, however, has not been devoid of African-American representation. First and foremost, there's the obvious. Cast members. That's not exactly intentional representation, however. Don't worry, there's been some intentional representation. You know, kind of. From August of 1955 to 1970, Frontierland, and eventually New Orleans Square, would have an Aunt Jemima pancake house. And there's Aunt Jemima. I didn't say it was good representation. Interesting note, however, is that there was a face character for Aunt Jemima at the pancake house from 1955 until the portrayer of Aunt Jemima, Eileen Lewis, passed away in 1966. But like I said, this representation isn't exactly... great. Aunt Jemima is a brand owned by Quaker Oats Company, so really, this is just capitalism being capitalism. The real problem, however, is Aunt Jemima's origins. Although her character has evolved over the years, Aunt Jemima was originally based off the Mammy archetype, and this representation was the version of the character used at Disneyland and up until 1989. Aunt Jemima, however, did not actually originate with the Quaker Oat Company. In in fact, it does <sighs> Aunt Jemima was a minstrel show character. White men would darken up their skin, put on some mammy costume, and would perform in drag. It wasn't until 1889, after Aunt Jemima had become a popular minstrel character, that Quaker Oats would go ahead and create the brand. The better representation in New Orleans Square, however, is the inclusion of Princess Tiana from Princess and the Frog, and of course, the foe, Dr. Falsier. Um, maybe Naveen as well? I have no idea what culture Naveen's supposed to be from, but just Naveen is too light-skinned, and this face character here, he is not African-American. However, the inclusion of the Princess and the Frog characters has created a bit more permanent, you know, representation. As for whether or not it's positive representation, that is debatable. I mean, Princess and the Frog whitewashes history pretty bad. It plays down the whole Jim Crow thing. Like, it, it, it's made to seem like the only obstacle Tiana is facing at that time is the fact that she's a woman. And there's also the whole voodoo thing. You know, I'm looking at video they just played of the uh, Donald Glover childish gambino dance he's doing that he probably thinks you think is real original that's a voodoo dance he's doing just we get our first african-american princess and there's the inclusion of voodoo in the movie that being said dr falsier is really awesome his song is just great his motivations are understandable and he is voiced by the legendary 
Keith freaking David. So what's my point here? Well, whether or not Disney wanted to, they have glossed over a major detail about New Orleans, and they celebrate the city that spawned by the lives of those enslaved. So what am I saying? That I want New Orleans to be demolished? Oh, no, not at all. That would just... No, don't get rid of the mansion. Do I want to see ghost slaves? Well, on one hand, that is super distasteful, but on the other is dance macabre. Whether we are the oppressors or the oppressed, in the end, it makes no difference to death. But no, it's still problematic. What I think would be better is more representation of different cultures, as is, most of the ghosts in the mansion seem to be of European or American descent, which is just a small portion of the world. But, you know, just change some of these ghosts, like, make this dude, make this king dude here into Mansa Musa, give some of the dancers different garb, give one of these tea drinkers a kimono, make the band just different, you know, like, everybody part of different cultures, and they all play different instruments that are from their cultures. I mean, let's be honest here, this is Disney, so the representation would be pretty stereotypical, I'm sure, but it would be a start. Pirates is a bit more complicated. For that, it wouldn't be as easy as just changing out the costume and accessories of audio animatronics. Instead, they would have to reskin them, but as we've seen, it is definitely possible. In 1993, Disney announced that they were going to build a park called Disney's America. The executive director for the park, Bob Weiss, af shortly after the park was announced, said, How could you do a park on America and not talk about slavery? The park will deal with the highs and lows. We want to make you feel what it was like to be a slave and what it was like to escape through the Underground Railroad. This statement, as might be expected, was derided by critics. I'm certainly not going to argue that New Orleans Square needs to have an attraction on slavery, but I do have an idea. The Disney Dream Suite, right above the Pirates of the Caribbean, isn't being used for much right now. So my idea is to turn that into a museum and have it be about the different people and the different cultures that have gone on to influence New Orleans. You know, the Native Americans, the French, the Spanish, the English, the Americans... Colonial Americans, obviously. And yes, have a part of it be about those that we enslaved and exploited, too. It is an important part of New Orleans history. America is a melting pot. We've heard it all our lives, and it is true. And I kind of feel like no other city demonstrates this as well as New Orleans. Now, I know that there's going to be people saying I'm making a big deal out of nothing, Although I imagine that these people, you know, clicked off after this, you know, they didn't make it past the second paragraph. But the fact is that representation does matter. And we live in a world where people get married on plantations, and a troubling chunk of the United States does not believe that defending the institution of slavery was the primary reasons for the southern states to secede. We're only 42 years away from the bicentennial of the American Civil War. This is not ancient hi this is not ancient history. And we have forgotten just how horrible this institution was and how the early United States was dependent on those lives lost. Actually, I shouldn't say lost. Lost, I should say stolen. And to the racists that don't like what I have to say because it's in the past, racism is over, whatever dumb thing you're thinking, eat my ass.